Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life. Welcome to another episode of Celebrating Act 2 with Manny Pacheco, the Hollywood historian, forgotten Hollywood, Hollywood that's not forgotten, Hollywood that hasn't been invented yet, and my great partner, <laughs> John Coleman. Hi, guys. How are you doing, Art John? Hey, Manny, did Art mangle every one of your titles? No, I think he did a great job with that. That's the best opening I've ever heard him do on this show. Okay, well, I'm, I, I think it. I'm going to actually record that, uh, and so I just, I'll play it every time. I'll yeah. I love that. You know what, Art? Cut, print, you got it. <laughs> if, if Art doesn't have the book right in front of him, he doesn't know from nothing. Right. Actually, if you'd like, I can make that into an Do you still have an answering machine? Because you're like old school. No. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> so, Manny, today is Director's Day. You know I'm a director. I have a lot of favorite directors. I admire a lot of people's work. Who's your director for the day? You know, I am constantly speaking to folks uh, across the globe about their favorite directors. And, you know, the usual suspects always emerge. You know, it's always John Ford and Billy Wilder and Frank sure. Capra and Alfred Hitchcock. And then, of course, the more modern directors like Scorsese and Spielberg and, yep. uh, you know, the like. You, you, I mean, you you get what I'm talking about. Yeah. Oh, they're all and, great and, names. Yeah. And a couple of, what, a couple of, about a month and a half or two months ago, we spoke about one of my uh, directors, uh, William Wellman. Well, I got another one. And he may, may be my favorite director that just never gets into the conversation, and I can't figure out why. And that's the great Stanley Kramer. Oh. Yeah. Stanley Kramer was just one of these guys that emerged in the 1950s and then uh, continued into the 1960s, making these social dramas that were very, very well done for a variety of reasons, because he always employed the top actors, the best the best talent around to tell these remarkable stories. And Kramer was also smart enough not to always direct the piece. Sometimes he just produced the piece as he did in High Noon and, and allowed Fred Zinneman, uh, Zinneman uh, to, to uh, take over and, uh, and, and do a really tight, you know, 90 minute piece with, with, with uh, an Academy Award winning performance by, by Gary Cooper. But it also included Lloyd Bridges, a very young Grace Kelly, uh, Katie Hirado, um, Lon Chaney Jr., and yeah. uh, Thomas Mitchell. I mean, just it's just a wonderful piece, but he wasn't the director, but he did produce High Noon. Yeah, that's interesting. I, his name got lost uh, behind uh, Fred Zinneman, who directed it, and I think won an Academy Award for it, did he not? Uh, uh, I, I, you know, I can't tell you whether okay. he did. Well, he, I could have that. He, I could he, be could, he could have, but I, I, I'm not sure that he did. Yeah. Uh, but you know what? The, nonetheless, High Noon is one of those, you know, mm -hmm. seminary uh, oh. westerns, of course. Absolutely. And, it's and, an and, it's, and it's, you know what? It, it was considered a, um, a, an allegory to what was going on with the McCarthy hearings, that they were forcing people to name names. And if you refuse to, as Gary Cooper stands alone against the bad guys, you're yeah. ostracized. And yeah. so John Wayne hated High Noon as others, and I think I've mentioned before that he decided to make Rio Bravo as a, as a, an answer to High Noon, where everybody gets involved to help beat the bad guys. So yeah, yeah it's you know it, he really liked these social pieces, but he was also smart enough to hire just the finest actors, as he did, for example, in the Defiant Ones with an up and coming Sidney Poitier and, and of course Tony Curtis. And the Theodore Bakel in a great supporting role. The Defiant Ones really, uh, really challenged race in the 1950s. A very early look at uh, when you when you have the collaboration of white and black uh, in, on film, and, and it was done intelligently with uh, with lots of substance and style. So the Defiant Ones is another great example of of the fine work of Stanley Kramer. Yeah. Um, what were his, am I correct that he do was he involved in Tootsie? No, I don't think he was. Uh, who was uh, who played uh, who was the director who played uh, Sydney against Pollack. Dustin Hoffman as his agent? Sydney Pollack. Oh, mm. Sydney Pollack. Sorry, confusing yes. them. Well, yeah, yeah Stan, Stan, Stanley would have been in his eighties or nineties by that time. But you know, let me just say that the where he recognized talent, he was a huge. Huge fan of Spencer Tracy, 
And they began a collaboration of films that were really unparalleled for a number of years. And, and, and it started with Inherit the Wind. And again, the monkey trial, Darwinism, the scopes, you know, trial that was going on in the 1920s was looked at was such a plum by Spencer Tracy and and uh, Frederick March. Um, it, it, Dick York was in the film as well, Harry Morgan and Claude Akins. And it's it's such a powerful, ferocious. I mean, there is no nuance at all to this film. I mean, there is just it hits you over the head as to what the values of creationism is as opposed to evolution. And and Kramer was not going to let up. The, all the nuance came from the actors, uh, March and Tracy. And, and for his work, Tracy was nominated for one of his uh, nine Academy Award nominations. So, yeah, and then that, that led to another wonderful uh, social piece, Judgment at Nuremberg, in many ways, one of the all-time great films of the decade, the 1960s, about the, um, the, the lasting effects of the Nuremberg trials. Yeah. And uh, an all-star cast, by the way, joining Tracy, I mean, Maximilian Schell in an Academy Award-winning role, Judy Garland and Montgomery Clift in smaller roles, Richard Whitmark, Burt Lancaster, Marlena Dietrich. I mean, it is just such a powerful movie. It runs three hours long. It never feels like it's three hours, but it really makes you look at how, what the German point of view was um, during the Holocaust and how there were lots of folks that will claim they didn't know what was going on. Yeah. Uh, but there's always that wink and a nod that they did know. And they just, they just can't imagine the horror that was, that was, the, the, that was world war two. And, and, and everyday people had to, you know, survive that in Germany. And, and that, that film takes a really raw look at that. And boy, I'll tell you, I, I, when it's on television, which isn't often, that is must see TV for me. Now, Manny, you make it almost sound because you're concentrating on his um, his uh, the, the works that he chose to film. You almost make it sound like he was not considered a director's actor, a, an actor's director, and yet he was, wasn't he? Wasn't well, he very good with actors? If your name was Lon Chaney Jr. or Spencer Tracy or Catherine Hepburn, he was, but not not everybody warmed up. To, uh, to to Stanley Kramer. I, I don't think that um, that Burt Lancaster was particularly fond of Kramer. Um, I, I, and there were others, but but he did have his favorites. I mean, he was no John Ford. He, I mean, he wasn't, you know, Raoul Walsh, where he would treat every one of his cast members like dirt. But, yeah. but, uh, but, but, you know, he did have his favorites and he would return to those. Harry Morgan was a favorite. He returned to, he, he made a couple of films with him. Uh, Lon Chaney Jr. was was really one of his all time favorites, and not because he did horror films, because he really recognized him as a good, solid actor. But Spencer Tracy was his good go to guy, and uh, even when he was going to make an uproarious comedy with "It's a Mad, 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 Mad World," um, Stanley Kramer had Spencer Tracy anchor the film because he remembered that Tracy could do comedy. He did great comedy with, with Hepburn and Adam's Rib and Pat and Mike and yeah. Desk Set and Father of the Bride with Joan Bennett and Elizabeth Taylor. Tracy could do comedy. Now, look, he was no Milton Berle or Jonathan Wil Winters or Phil Silvers or Sid Caesar, but he could still hold his own with comedians. Yes. And th there's a certain testimony to that. And, and, Kramer really wanted to step away from those social dramas. But at the end of the day, it's a mad, 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 mad world is a look at greed and what greed can do to the common individual. Now, it's, it's plainly satire to me, it, it wrapped in a bow of slapstick. Yeah. And, and oh, I don't know that the film could have been as good without Kramer at the helm. I think, I think you get more of um, the great race, which is all slapstick and no nuance or substance, or Rat Race was a cheap imitation of It's a Mad, 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 Mad World. It's a Mad, 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 Mad World still stands up because of the social commentary and slapstick co collaborating together and what I think is a remarkable film. Yeah, well, it is. It's a classic. Um, and good point. You make a good point. Do you remember, uh, because I'm not that familiar with Kramer's films as, as his work, do you remember his first and last film? 
I don't remember his first film or his last film, but I remember when he was having his most successful time, which was between 1952 and I would say 1968 or nine, uh, 68 or nine with The Secret of Santa Vittoria. Uh, which is a really, really cute I film. I love that film. It's a really cute film with uh, with with Anthony Quinn, and uh, yeah, it's it's a really, really fun film. But let me, you know, Kramer really because of when when he grew up, Kramer always wanted to go back and handle two issues that were important to him: uh, war, especially World War, as yeah. in World War II, and race. Yeah. And two films I want to mention. Um, he did one film where Tracy was just too sick to work. And Catherine Hepburn was unavailable because she was caring for Tracy, who was just in failing health. And he brought in, um, instead, Vivian Lee to replace Catherine Hepburn in Ship of Fools. And what a great film about a 1935 German cruise ship voyage prior to the advent of war. Hitler was firmly in power, but yeah. what were the Germans like prior to war as opposed to judgment at Nuremberg? after war. It's a great examination. And let me just tell you, a, a couple of people really shine. Michael Dunn plays a um, a vagabond, and he's a dwarf, as you know, he's a dwarf actor, yeah. who was uh, proudly one of the fools on this ship. And he, and he called himself an obvious fool just because of, of, of what, you know, his, his size. But he's the smartest guy on the ship, and he's anything but a fool. And for his work, he earned an Academy uh, Award nomination for Best Supporting Actor. But there's others, uh, Jose Ferrar, uh, Lee Marvin, uh, George Siegel. I mean, just just great actors. And it's, it's, it's a ship, and it's, it's basically drawing room drama. But the undertones are Hitler is going to invade countries, and war is at hand. And some people choose to uh, ignore it, and some people know it's going to happen. And... Yeah. Uh, how they all react is amazing, and only, again, Kramer's touch could, could really handle that. Now, the film after that, he, uh, two years later, dealt with race in a very calm yet profound way in Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. Here, uh, here he is with great actors again, Tracy and Hepburn and Sidney Poitier again. I mean, he would always return to the actors he could trust most, and they do a wonderful job at looking at something that we take for granted today. But back in the 1960s, mixed marriage was outlawed in a number of states. Yep. And the idea that um, that their child, uh, the, the parents, uh, Tracy and Hepper, was going to marry an African-American, you know, caused all sorts of clamor and, and hoopla. But yeah. it's all it's all done with a with a little bit of a wink and a nod. And everybody seems to be really likable. And, you know, at the end of the day, it turns out to be a really fitting tribute to Spencer Tracy, who died just 10 days later. Wow. Wow. Uh, you know, you you have really opened my eyes. I have never looked at uh, Kramer's body of work. Mm -hmm. I certainly knew his name and seen most of the films we've talked about. But um, it's interesting, the perspective that he was that he had these themes that he would come mm -hmm. back to and that he had a, a, a serious social conscience right. uh, about his filmmaking. And, and a love for really great talent. And he returned to that talent over and over again. And he was yeah. unabashed about that. So, yeah. I mean, look at it this way. Every director has their favorites. Hitchcock had Cary Grant and James sure. Stewart. And so, so did uh, uh, um, 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 Billy Wilder had Jack Lemmon. Uh, Frank Capra had James Stewart. I mean, and Gary Cooper. Uh, I mean, there are there are directors. Uh, John Wayne and 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 John Ford are legendary. I mean, obviously, and of course John Huston and and Humphrey Bogart. So you know what? It, it it's wonderful that Tracy, at the end of his career, had Stanley Kramer. I, I can't think of a more fitting collaboration to end the career of the great Spencer Tracy in in, in his work with Stanley Kramer. Yeah, yeah. What a fascinating discussion. Uh, who, else but, who else but about three people on the planet other than Manny Pacheco would actually be able to tie all that stuff together, which for most of us is pretty obscure. So thank you, Manny, once again for uh, sharing your knowledge and, and pulling all this stuff together, which uh, it's, I don't think there's a book written about it. There's, there's no articles written about it. It's, 
it happened here live today. Thank you. <laughs> Isn't that the best way to do it though? Live, right? <laughs> That's a lot of fun. Yeah. Manny, thank you so much. Thank you. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.